This service is a little different than most of the services that we have throughout the course of the year. And of course, there's a good reason for that. We're remembering Jesus' sacrificial love, his death on the cross that saves us, that saves the whole world. Uh, tonight, we are going to be looking at the seven statements that Jesus makes from the cross. And we've asked seven people from our Hope Ankeny congregation to share short reflections on that. Always good to hear from people who are not pastors. That's going to be fantastic. They're good preachers, I'll, I'll guarantee you that. So uh, be prepared for uh, the emotions that go with this service. There is joy and hope, absolutely, but there's also deep sorrow. A uh, good time for you to reflect and to think about things that we don't typically spend time thinking about. So let's get started with our Good Friday service. So as we get started, I want to invite you to stand and let's sing this song together.
Thanks for singing. You can have a seat. Two others who were criminals <clears throat> were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. I've always found it remarkable that in the face of a grueling death, Jesus asked for forgiveness of those who were going to kill him. It makes me ask of myself, how is my forgiveness game these days? While this passage in Luke <clears throat> has to be the ultimate display of forgiveness, the Bible is jam-packed with other examples. I think it's safe to say that forgiveness is the basis of our Christian faith. With that being the case then, why do we all seem to struggle with the concept? Maybe you're like me. I like to think that I'm the forgiving type. I tell myself and others that I have no interest in carrying around a grudge, but deep down I know that's not 100% accurate. And look at our country today. Forgiveness doesn't seem to be in vogue. In fact, the opposite seems to be true. Our country is so bitterly divided that even a global pandemic couldn't unite us. That's shocking. And that's not only sad, but if that's what the future holds for us, it's scary. So what can we do? I would love to encourage you to forgive others like Jesus did in Luke chapter 23, but that's asking for an awful lot. And I'll be honest, I know I fall short of that standard. And especially if I was confronted with a similar circumstance. It helps me to look at another powerful example of forgiveness found earlier in the book of Luke, the story of the prodigal son. Growing up, I had two older brothers, and I always thought I could relate to this story, except I omitted the fact that the prodigal son was the youngest, uh, because that would have meant it was me. So when this parable would be discussed or preached on, in the small rural church I attended growing up, I always inserted my brother Dave's name for that role. And he was the one who squandered his inheritance, lived a sinful life, and became so destitute that he had to return home in shame. And of course, I was the one who was appalled that we would throw such a, an elaborate celebration upon his return. It took me a few years to realize the most par powerful part of that story and maybe that has to do something with me becoming a father myself. As a, as a child, I was distracted by the father offering the servants to get his best garments and kill the fatted calf for his son's return. But these days, it's the fact that the father rushed out to greet him that amazes me. In, the, in that part of the, the story, it reads, but while his son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son. He threw his arms around and kissed him. Today, I realize that in many ways, I'm the prodigal son, that I have squandered a rich inheritance by falling short of the standard that Jesus sets for us. And yet, I am comforted because I know that I have a father who is actively pursuing a relationship with me, despite all the things that I've done. So when Jesus forgives the men who are leading him to his death, we shouldn't be surprised. It's the same type of forgiveness that we read in the Bible over and over again. It should be a reminder to us all that no matter how far gone you think you are, no matter what sins you may have committed, it doesn't have to be the end of your story. Jesus' death was the punishment for all of our sins. He sacrificed it all so that we could be forgiven. I want to invite you to stand and sing again.
from Luke 23, 39 through 43. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you, Today you will be with me in paradise. This is the word. The reason this promise is so special to our family this season is the promise it offers to all of us. Contextually, we see Jesus hanging on the cross, bleeding, suffering, and agonizing, along with him a criminal on either side. The criminal sin remind us of our own sin with perfection hanging in the middle. Good Friday often focuses on the suffering and sacrifice. As I reflected on our own family's walk with my father-in-law's long-term illness with cancer, the ache and suffering he felt, we felt that ache along with him. Near the end of his illness, I stumbled across Job's story in my devotional and his trials of losing his family, his job, his friends rebuking him, and God's distance. But through it all, Job was aching well. What? He was aching well because he had the hope of Jesus. And it made me realize through Papa's sickness and passing, we would ache and suffer, but we could do it well. We could do it well with a promise that Jesus was going to heal Papa completely. When Jesus says, assuredly, I'll be with you today in paradise, Jesus gives the criminal this option of paradise too. As the criminal had taken up Jesus' offer, and Jesus gives that to us all. So for our family, when we see the cross this Easter season, it reminds us of the deep ache we felt, but it also reminds us of how we were able to ache well and be healed. We also see the joy in his promises fulfilled in paradise. So although we cannot escape the ache here on this side of heaven, we can ache well knowing his joy is promised and a guarantee. Why would we hang on to our own suffering if Jesus is promising the criminal, promising Job, promising all of us the opportunity for joy in paradise? Papa was not a talkative man, but he managed to always tell us, thank you for stopping by, I love you. Isn't that what Jesus is doing? He stopped by to save and forgive us. He ached well and he gave us a promise. So my words for him are, thank you. Thank you for stopping by, and I love you. Let's stand and sing together one more time. Cross 
from John, chapter 19, verses 25 through 27. Jesus said to his mother, Woman, this is your son. Then he said to his disciple, This is your mother. Everyone has their own way of dealing with loss and the realities that come with not being able to see a loved one anymore. It's something I think we've all felt one time or another. And in the past year, more people have been hit with the gutting feeling of loss than any time I can remember. It's been a year of isolation, of anxiety, of fear, and of heartache. I can feel that same pain, that same hurt in this passage. The tone Jesus strikes in these verses, when he is basically bestowing a son, John, onto his own mother, Mary, is one that stood out to me. Mary is watching her oldest son carry his own cross up a hill or he will soon die for the sins of mankind. She is losing her flesh and blood before her very eyes. Jesus knows this. He's clearly hurting. 
not just because of his own dire situation, but because of the emotional and spiritual pain his mother is in. No son wants to see their mother hurting. It's a very relatable feeling. Jesus spent a lot of his life teaching scripture and spent a lot of time away from his birth family. But when he sees Mary, he knows he has to take care of her. He doesn't want his mother to be left without a disciple to keep her safe. As in most of my research, I have the un- I've gotten the understanding that Jesus was, um, Joseph was considered to be dead by this time. Jesus' brothers hadn't become disciples yet either. So this meant that with Jesus gone, Mary would be without a spiritual guide. This obviously weighs on Jesus. He must have felt even more responsibility than he already did, if that was even possible. So as his death got closer with every step he took, he made the choice to protect his mother because he felt the most human emotion of all, love. Love is what can get people through traumatic periods, through the valleys and peaks of life. Not just love from God, but love from the family and friends around us. It's helped me through the loss of two of my grandparents in 2017, losses which came months apart after the most unhappy time of my life during my freshman year of college. It was there for my parents as they each lost one of their own parents. It was there for my friends, my girlfriend, everyone I know at some point or another. It was there when my mom got cancer when I was in third or fourth grade. Now, I didn't process that properly at the time, and I don't think anyone who was in my situation would. Nothing can prepare you for a moment like that, especially when you're a child in elementary school. I went from being an outspoken, um, outgoing kid to introverted and quiet. There were days where it got really difficult, not just for me, but for my little sisters, for my father, and obviously for my mother. But the love and compassion others showed our family while mom fought and beat this disease was eye-opening, as was the love and compassion from the church we went to at the time. I can't help but connect these two loves and feel that the love from others and God's unending love feed off of each other in the highest of highs and in those dark valleys. And in this specific instance, with his cross, And with his back holding up a cross, we see Jesus for what he is, all God and all man. A loving father, but at the same time, a son wanting to make sure his mother is safe before he departs.
Insanity. The Gospel reading from Matthew, Matthew 27, verses 45 through 46. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, yama sabachthani, this is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And this is the word. So God is there and Jesus is on the cross and he asks, why have you forsaken me, my father? And he looks up and his father had his back to him because he couldn't be in that presence of the weight of the sin that Jesus held on that cross. And so Jesus at that moment, the father that he loves the most, that he become one with, turned his back and abandoned him at that very moment. And he's like, where did he go? Can you, I can imagine it. Um, and it just made me question the times that I cried out when Jesus had cried out, thinking, then I'm okay crying out to God. Because this last year, I don't know about you, but it's been a difficult year with the pandemic. Um, just with everything going on a year ago here, um, they shut everything down. And uh, so my kids couldn't go back to school. None of the kids could go, you know. And what they knew as um, normal wasn't normal anymore. We had to go online. And, and uh, they couldn't play the activities they wanted to play. And it was all new as navigating um, our home with four kids, it's like, wow, what do you do in this situation? We don't know. And I just felt so alone at that time. Um, I just felt like, God, where are you? Like, can't you just make this stop, you know? And can't you change these things? And then going out throughout the year, I was like, you know, thinking, oh, it's going to get better. Well, then my grandparents this summer both got COVID and they're in their 90s and they're my last two grandparents. And I was just, you know, really scared. I thought they weren't going to make it through at 90 years old. And uh, um, and they both made it through. But then later on, my grandma did health health complications and she ended up passing away. Um, and it was just super hard because I asked again, God, where are you? I couldn't get to see her. I had to see her through the window of the nursing home and I couldn't embrace her and hug her and love on, on, you know, the loved ones that you care so much about, you know, and you just want to see them and touch them and hug them and say, it's going to be all right. But I couldn't. And I just cried out to God, like, where are you? Why can't you make this um, COVID stop? Why this sickness stop, Lord? And then going on further um, throughout the year, I, I was just faced with some tough conversations with my mom. Um, I've always wanted a relationship with her. And at the age of 12, my parents got a divorce and it was really tough on me being the oldest um, child of three kids and uh, having to carry that weight of taking care of my siblings because my mom wasn't around. And so at the age of 12, I was going to the grocery store, um, taking care, getting the food that I need to get for my siblings to take care of, all the while trying to handle my middle school studies and play all four sports in school and uh, trying to manage it all. And that weight was just so heavy. And uh, and I, I, I just cried out again in those moments, like, God, where are you? You know, I just, I can't can't carry this burden. And I felt that's what Jesus was doing on the cross. This burden is too heavy to carry. Light my load, God. Where are you? Why have you forsaken me? And so in those moments, it was just really hard. And then we finished out the year um, as uh, my husband um, with several hundred in his company lost their jobs. And so he was our breadwinner. And so it's one of those things that, you know, you just get everything stripped away that you know um, of your life in this um, last year and it just made things really hard and it just made you face things really hard and you realize when I just got down on my knees I just cried out to him Lord where are you I feel all alone I'm isolated I, I'm a people person and I'm not able to like you know connect with others you know and it was just super hard and it just made me um, realize that God just spoke and whispered in my ear one moment when I was in my room just crying out to me he's like I'm here. I've never left you. I am by your side. 
and in your pain and suffering, I'm not letting go. You are, you are going to be carried through this. I'm going to take your hand and walk with you. And so I just want to encourage you tonight that God is not leaving you through your pain and suffering. He's walking with you. He's carrying you in moments where you don't feel like you can go on. He's strengthening you when sometimes you feel like you lost all your strength. And he just made me realize not to focus on our circumstances, but to keep our eyes focused on him. And that's what Jesus was doing. He knew the will of God was to die for our sins. And how powerful that was. He fulfilled the will of God, even though when he felt God had turned his back and abandoned him in that moment. And so I just want you to realize, guys, when you're faced with these circumstances, this suffering, that he wants your eyes on him and on him alone and not on what our present circumstances may be. And he wants to encourage you by just saying, you know, when you pray to him and ask to lighten your load, he'll bring you a peace and joy that subsides all understanding. And he has shown me that through all of this, God has shown me everything's going to be okay. And my peace is what I'm going to give you. And so I pray that you have that peace as you go into now Good Friday and going into Easter, that God will bring you that peace and joy that comes on Easter morning. Can
fifth word comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 19, verse 28. Jesus knew that his mission was now finished, and to fulfill scripture, he said, I am thirsty. I'd, I'd like to ask each of you to just think of a time when you experienced extreme thirst, uh, when you were parched. If you can think of a time, maybe when you were really sick or after a hard workout or heat of an Iowa summer. When Jesus was on the cross, it's likely he hadn't drank anything for 12 to 18 hours. He had been brutally beaten. He had carried his own massive heavy cross and his body had been nailed to that cross. By this time, he'd lost a tremendous amount of blood and body fluids and he'd endured an incredible amount of suffering on our behalf. It's absolutely no mistake that his thirst was real. Jesus was human and he was feeling the same pain and thirst that we do. After hanging on the cross for hours, Jesus said, I am thirsty. As a physician, a number of years ago, I had the privilege of accompanying a group of cancer survivors and caregivers to the peak of Mount Kilimanjaro, and it's at about 19,000 feet. It was, it was a long hike. Um, we had people in their 20s on up to their 70s and all, from all over the U.S. and all walks of life. We, we even had a, a priest and a retired deacon with us. We'd start each day with group yoga and then we'd have a devotion uh, and a quick breakfast. And then as we prepared for our hike, we, we packed our bag full of all of our day's necessities. Um, and then we'd make sure that we, we took as much water as we could comfortably carry. We'd break up into groups in order to, to help support those who needed more physical or emotional support. And then along the way, we stopped a lot uh, to take a break and, and we would reflect on, on our experience. And then at night, <clears throat> uh, Father Frank would, would lead us in grace for dinner and then we would share those stories over dinner. As a group doc, um, I would go around and make tent rounds every morning and check on everybody's health and see, see if they had any needs that, that I could tend to. And then I would do the same throughout the day and again at night. Common complaints were headache and nausea related to the effects of altitude. Uh, but one of my biggest concerns was uh, were they drinking enough water because it was really easy to get dehydrated up on the mountain. Um, water was absolutely essential to everybody's safety and survival, uh, but it wasn't easy to get. Uh, we had to gather it from streams or melt snow along the way and it was it was full of infectious organisms. So despite the fact we'd sterilize it, um, a lot of people end up getting sick along the way and risked severe dehydration. Each day of the hike was tougher than the one before, but after seven days we made it to the top and it it was one of the most amazing things, uh, experiences of my life. Um, the view was absolutely majestic. Um, people were high-fiving and cheering and hugging, and some people were crying. Um, we had carried prayer flags for people who couldn't make the trip. 
So <clears throat> in reverence, we hung those flags and shared a moment of silence and said prayers for those who had lost their battle. As, <clears throat> as much as it was a, uh, it was a physically demanding journey, uh, you know, I, looking back, it was so much more of a, a spiritual journey. Um, a lot of the people on the trip were still, still battling cancer. After spending a total of nine days on the, on the mountain, um, we got to know one another really well. We had a lot of time to talk, and in, in those conversations, uh, one of the things that kept coming up over and over, no matter who I talked to, was the fact that um, the, the suffering that they had been through with their, their cancer, both physical and emotional, had, had brought them closer to their friends and to family and to God. Um, I think God created in the heart of all of us um, a deep sense or a deep thirst to know him. Um, we all long for that relationship with God, and, and we have this deep sense of wanting something more in life or needing something more. And Jesus knows that without him, we're spiritually dehydrated. Um, he loves us, and, and even though he was near death, he was concerned about our salvation. He was thirsting for our souls. He wants us to, to acknowledge that thirst and to, and to grow closer to him and to follow him. He promises this to all who seek him. Jesus said to the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, verse 13 and 14, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life.
The sixth word comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 19, verses 29 and 30. They put a sponge soaked in wine on a sprig of hyssop and put it up to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and handed over the spirit. As I reflect on this passage, the three word phrase, it is finished, captures my attention. There's two things that I really take away. How can something so good come to an end? And will I be ready for my it is finished moment? How could Jesus' life on earth be so short? I'm sure that's what his followers thought as they watched him tortured and ultimately die on the cross. He did so many things while on this earth. He fed the hungry, healed the sick, brought back the dead, and ultimately taught and spread the word of God. And just after he says, it is finished, his life on earth is over. Fast forward to modern day, to today. There are so many good things that happen to all of us. Great events, great moments, great experiences. But at some point, they'll come to an end. Just take a moment and think. Think of some of those experiences you've had, the events you've been to, a relationship that you've had. I'm sure you've never wanted those good ones to ever end, but unfortunately, they more than likely did. I can think of some of my own experiences. Enjoying, enjoying a ride of a favorite sports team as they continue to winning streak. The first few moments as, you, as we held our, each of our girls after they were born, Family vacations, nobody wants a family vacation to ever end. Gatherings with family or friends that you haven't seen in a long time. Life is full of these events, but again, more often than not, they come to an end. For those who were closest to Jesus, they didn't want to see his time on earth end. But if they only knew what his sacrifice meant and what his sacrifice was going to give them upon their own death, when I read finished, this signifies the end, the end of Jesus' human life on earth. There were times when Jesus struggled to accept this fate, but he knew he had to die that day on that cross. While Jesus experienced so many good things, but he also encountered many trials and tribulations, especially in those last few days of his life. As humans, we will face our own challenges and ultimately will face our own it is finished moment. But will we be ready like Jesus was? Jesus knew his fate long before he was condemned to the cross. For many of us, we will never know when that day will arrive. I recently faced my own challenge Back in December, I faced a situation that could have led to my it is finished time on this earth. I was diagnosed with coronary artery disease, which required major open heart surgery, which ultimately had to repair those issues that were developed during the disease. As a healthy, active 47-year-old, that news was devastating. It was a complete surprise and ultimately very surreal. And it wasn't that I was facing imminent death at that moment. But by chance, if something went wrong on that operating table, it could have been, it is, it is finished. Was I ready for that moment? Again, we know Jesus was ready and he sacrificed to give us the opportunity of eternal life. Again, remembering all those great things we experience here on earth that ultimately come to an end in heaven, those experiences will never end. And what about all those trials, tribulations, and challenges that we face here on earth? There will be none of those in heaven. Here's the thing, as we wind down Good Friday and mourn the events of Jesus' death, just remember, in three days, there will be something pretty incredible that happens. I encourage you to hang around and experience that celebration on Easter morning. And I hope it prepares you to be ready, ready to face your it is finished moment, whenever that may come.
The seventh word comes from the 23rd chapter of Luke, verses 44 through 46. By this time, it was about noon, and darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. The light from the sun was gone. And suddenly, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn down the middle. Then Jesus shouted, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. And with those words, he breathed his last. I like to think of myself as a resourceful problem solver. Generally, when faced with complex challenge, I tend to prioritize action. Instead of just admiring the problem or getting overwhelmed by the details, I like to take concrete steps to make things better. For example, within a few days of my office closing last spring, I had rearranged the home office with a new desk, boosted our internet capacity, laid out a new family routine. Sure, that meant we were gonna get through this pandemic just fine. When there's a problem that's likely too difficult, unpleasant, or painful to solve, I wanna take action to just get through it quickly. Generally, I think, well, the sooner we start, the sooner this will be over. This approach was likely born out of my childhood experiences as I grew to realize I could not always depend on others to get what I wanted or needed. For instance, my family's lack of financial resources meant if I wanted to go to college, I would need to work multiple jobs, save up lots of money, study hard, get good grades, earn a scholarship. Most often, these sorts of efforts were rewarded. My mantra became, if it is to be, it is up to me. Generally, this, dis this disposition is seen as positive by society, and it can be good and helpful. It can be how things get done. But this tendency is also a flaw in that it creates the illusion of control. I wonder, did any who were at the cross on Calvary that day generally consider themselves resourceful problem solvers? Um, if so, how did they make sense of their current situation? The whole earth was dark, their beloved leader and friend hanging from the cross. Did they wonder, how did we end up here? Perhaps their minds were full of if-onlys. If only Jesus had stayed away from Jerusalem this week. If only he hadn't angered the religious leaders. If only he would show his divine power, end this painful suffering, and just make it all go away. What could be done? How could they just get this over with quickly? What would that even mean? In that moment, as they sat in the darkness at the foot of the cross, there was nothing they could do but accept the situation to confront reality and let the consequences play out. As I try to imagine the darkness of that moment, I'm transported in my mind back to my own darkest hours. Only, unlike the disciples, my darkest time was a situation of my own creation, a res direct result of my actions. It was nearly 30 years ago, and I was a junior in college. It was two o'clock in the morning, and I was just getting back to the dorms from the police station where I had been booked on charges of OWI, of drunk driving. Earlier that night, my friends and I had decided to head out to a local bar to relax, shoot some pool, have fun. Typically, when we went out, we all went together in one vehicle, took turns serving as a designated driver. This night was different. A friend and I rode separately in my car. We went to a different place, one I hadn't been to before. And instead of buying myself a single drink, we decided to all chip in and buy some pitchers. 
Now it was 2 a.m. and I was home alone in the dark. How could I make sense of this situation? How did I end up here? My mind was full of if onlys. If only I had replaced the headlight of my car when I discovered it was burnt out weeks earlier. If only we'd left the bar a little earlier or a little later, instead of at the exact moment a police officer happened to be driving past. If only I'd paid attention to how much I was actually drinking or noticed that my glass never seemed to be empty. If only I'd have called a friend to come pick us up or I'd chosen not to drink at all. As I sat there in the darkness, I came to understand the gravity of the situation. An OWI arrest would mean jail time and many hours of community service. I would lose my driver's license and access to my car that I'd worked so hard to purchase just six months earlier. It would mean a lifetime of always answering yes to the question, have you ever been convicted of a crime on every job application and volunteer background check? As painful as those would be to endure, had I not been pulled over immediately after leaving the bar, it's horrifying to think the consequences could have been much worse. Perhaps I would have caused innocent people to be injured or killed. I was used to being able to overcome barriers, to find a way to solve the problem. However, my mantra did not serve me well in this situation. My actions are what got me here but they couldn't get me out. Now, there was no way to fix the situation, to make it go away. There was no way to get through it quickly. There was nothing I could do in that moment but accept the situation, confront reality, and let the consequences play out. And that is where I join the followers of Jesus today, in the darkness at the foot of the cross. We have the benefit of 2,000 years of hindsight. We know what the third day will bring. My tendency, and perhaps yours, is to want to get through this part quickly, to lessen the pain and discomfort of this day. But let's not rush there. For now, let's just sit in the darkness. Let's stop and understand the gravity of the situation. It's our sin that got us here, that put Jesus on that cross, there's no way for us to fix it. We must let the consequences of that sin play out. But as we do so, let's look to Jesus. Even though he could have, he didn't lessen the pain or make it go away. In this moment, instead, he chooses to trust, to surrender as he cries out to the Father. Let us choose likewise as we sit in darkness today.
Father's love for us How vast beyond all measure That He should give His only Son And make a wretch His treasure How great the pain of searing loss The Father turns His face away As wounds which mar the chosen one Bring many sons to glory Behold the man up on the cross My sin upon his shoulders Ashamed I hear my mocking voice Call out among the scoffers It was my sin that held him Until it was accomplished His dying breath has brought me life I know that it is finished I will not boast in No power, no wisdom But I will boast in Jesus Christ His death and resurrection Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart, His wounds have paid my rent.